Hey everyone, my name is Greg McKeon, uh, a product manager here at Cloudflare. I work on Cloudflare Workers, which is our serverless platform. Uh, super excited to be here and talk to you all today a little bit, both one about the Workers platform, but also about the Prisma data proxy and how that integrates into Cloudflare's Workers platform and really lets you build some cool apps um, and, and some cool architectures that we're really starting to explore together. So I think the place to start this whole conversation is sort of what is a Cloudflare worker? Uh, it's sort of a different programming paradigm than a lot of people are used to. Uh, and one we sort of stumbled on as we were building out uh, really tools that Cloudflare itself needed to scale. So a worker is a lightweight JavaScript isolate that runs in response to a trigger. Today, the triggers we support are HTTP requests or cron triggers. And the worker runs JavaScript code or WASM and then can communicate with other downstream data and services, right? By making HTTP calls out over a fetch API. Um, what's sort of great about workers is that they let you deploy at a global scale immediately and out of the box, right? So Cloudflare workers are deployed to every single one of Cloudflare's over 250 data centers. Um, that happens in under 30 seconds. So you get code that rolls out globally um, and then you can sort of work with immediately and have immediately deployed to your users. So what's actually under the hood here? How does this actually work? Well, we're running a lightweight V8 runtime um, for both JavaScript and WASM applications, essentially. We run what are called isolates, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, but are a bit lower overhead than containers. So your code is triggered by an HTTP request or a cron trigger coming in and returns an HTTP response back. So you write code once and it runs in all of these different points of presence around the world. Um, makes deploys really simple and makes scalability really, really straightforward. So the first thing we kind of confront with this is, is why did you build workers? Um, and, and the truth is we built it to give our customers the ability to write custom code, right? There are plenty of features that a CDN can implement that Cloudflare didn't. And we said, what if our customers could just write JavaScript that would actually let them build those features themselves? So we started there and then we started building our own applications on top of this. Um, there, there are a number of internal applications that run on top of workers today um, and more and more have started coming over over time. And what we realized is actually there's a, there's a lot of power in sort of this architecture being able to write these really lightweight functions that you can compose together um, and use to solve sort of bigger tasks. It really resembles sort of a microservices architecture. And we said, this is a really interesting programming paradigm. And our users saw that as well. Um, they saw the ability to kind of have this trusted environment that was in between, you know, maybe their main server today, but also close to their end user, uh, and the ability to modify requests as they were in flight was really, really compelling, uh, and it made for a really great developer experience. The other piece is that this was an extremely scalable architecture because of the fact that we were using isolates instead of containers, so they could spin up almost immediately and could be composed together in really interesting ways. So they started to say, hey, we want to do more than just modify Cloudflare CDN here. We want to actually use these at, you know, to implement our entire application, and that's where people really have been going with this. Um, so the next question we get then is, okay, so you're running Lambda at edge then. Um, you know, you're running containers at the edge. And I mentioned this before, but we're not actually running containers, right? We're running isolates, which are much lower overhead and can start up much more quickly. So V8 isolates, we can actually eliminate cold starts entirely, whereas, you know, a, a serverless uh, serverless container service like Lambda might have 100 milliseconds to get a container actually started. We actually can start an isolate in zero milliseconds. And if you think that's crazy, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be wrong to think that. Uh, the way we do this is when the TLS handshake comes in, we actually pre-warm the isolate and go grab it out of memory and put it into it, put it so it's actually hot and ready to process requests right away, um, which, is, which is pretty cool. Um, so you're able to kind of get this really high performance out of the platform without having infrastructure sitting around and waiting. Uh, and that's another really compelling piece of the platform. It scales up when you need it, it scales back down when you don't. And so our pricing can be really compelling and really cost effective um, because of the fact that you're, you're only actually running when a user is actually executing code. So sort of a thought experiment here to kind of show you the, the different paradigm you have when you're building for workers versus building on top of a containerized system. Let's say you wanted to let your users run completely untrusted code on your platform. A good example for this would be, you know, let's say I run uh, a social networking site um, that has different communities that run on top of it. Um, and I want to enable groups of moderators to go out and moderate the platform. And generally, what, one way this would this would come up is, you know, um, they could interact with some API that I expose out to them and you'd have a, a a number of bot um, uh, bot makers who would you know develop bots for that platform and, and kind of figure out how to actually run these moderation tasks. Um, 
And all of those bots would kind of interact with my API, which is my trusted sort of surface to expose that to developers. Um, but I wouldn't actually run the bot code for them, right? It would generally run on their own server somewhere else and they would call my, my API over HTTP or something. Um, and this is the way the, the world would work with containers, right? So, so let's, let's say I, I actually wanted to take my user's code that they were using to moderate these you know, communities um, on my platform, and I wanted to run it for them. Let's say I wanted to be able to, you know, validate what the code was doing, um, but also have give it more flexibility to run. Uh, if I was going to do this in containers, this wouldn't really be possible, right? What I have to do is have to spin up this really heavyweight container um, for each piece of code that could potentially be running at once. And then I'd have to find some infrastructure to actually let them communicate across each other. I could do it over HTTP and establish an you know, HTTP server for each, um, but that's a lot of infrastructure for me to manage. And it's, it's a lot of overhead, really. Um, but you can sort of see where the low overhead piece comes in because on workers, sure, that's sort of fine, right? What I could do is have my customer either deploy or run their own worker, which is already totally isolated by the design of the system. Um, one thing we're seeing is that this is a really compelling architecture, actually, that we're, we're working on building out further. Um, I, I think it's an interesting thought experiment because it is something that sort of seems odd. It doesn't seem possible in, in a containerized world. Um, but with these sort of workers functions, it makes sense, right? You're just calling another function that lives that lives somewhere else. Sure, it's someone else's and it's not necessarily trusted. And you should have a different level of permissions that you give to that code for sure. Um, but it's easier to compose these things together and really build, build interesting applications and interesting pipelines. And that's something we're working towards building on now. We don't have a total story here today. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to do, but this is something that's kind of coming and is on our mind. And I think it shows how this sort of paradigm is fundamentally different, right? It's fundamentally unlocking new use cases that you couldn't build um, on traditional architecture. So well, I mentioned before that we're getting to this place of supporting not only these new architectures, but also just complete applications that exist today. And the most challenging thing for us to support complete applications at the edge today is state. Right? So we're really good at spinning up stateless workers all across the world in all 250 different data centers. The problem is what happens when someone who's in Newark, New Jersey wants to talk to the same piece of data that someone in London wants to talk to, right? Um, this is the same problem databases have encountered for years, but it's a bit different for us because generally your application servers are co-located in one, one small region, right? That's the first piece. Um, they, they don't have to deal with this sort of global, uh, you know, massive number of connections coming into them. Um, the second piece is that traditional databases use TCP. They expect their connections to be long-lived. The worker's runtime is built on top of V8, uh, which you might know from the Chrome browser. There's no standard API for TCP, though we're working towards establishing one. Uh, and so what that means is that we, we don't support those traditional long-lived connections. Um, that makes it difficult for us to support traditional databases. Um, this also means when we look at NoSQL databases that support HTTP interfaces, those are great. I used to work at MongoDB, love NoSQL databases, but they all present differing interfaces, and that can be really difficult for developers to, to actually work with. And a lot of their data might be in, in you know a Postgres database somewhere, and they're not going to migrate that data just so that they can use workers to get the benefits of this, this global distributed serverless platform. That was a lot of a lot of buzzwords all back to back. Uh, so, so what is our general approach to solving this problem? What is our approach to data, databases, data platforms? One, we want to build opinionated tools that make new architectures possible, just like we're doing with workers for data. And so the big one there for us is durable objects. That could be a whole talk on its own. You can go read a little bit about them, um, but it's sort of our approach. It's, it's loosely based on top of the actor model or the Orleans grains um, system uh, that Azure has put out. Um, loosely based on top of those similar ideas uh, and the ability the, the idea is to sort of have a extremely horizontally scalable system of objects that compose some higher function um, and can store data for you on the network. Um, we also have Workers KV, which is an eventually consistent global database. And we've just announced R2, and we're really excited about R2. R2 is an object storage that doesn't have any egress fees associated with it. Um, and so th these are sort of tools that solve specific problems for developers. Um, but there's a whole lot of tools out there, and there's a whole lot of data that exists in plenty of tools today, right? Um, and we want to connect with the best of breed tools that, that fit well with our vision um, for that ecosystem, right? So that are that are really well designed for global data and are kind of pushing things forward and making data easier to work with. And Prisma is an obvious example of that. Uh, and that's why I'm here today to chat a little bit about the, the Prisma data connect, the Prisma data proxy, I'm sorry, yeah, um, specifically. So what the Prisma data proxy does is it exposes an HTTP interface to your backing database. This is exciting because now workers can talk to the Prisma data proxy, which can talk to your backing database. 
Um, it supports a large number of backend databases, uh, MySQL, SQL Server, Postgres, and MongoDB, and gives you access to all of those from workers. Um, through a common API though. So you have the ability to access your data regardless of which data platform it's actually sitting on um, through a worker specifically, which is which is huge. This is now a way you know, for you to be able to build that full stateful application that you've wanted to build um, with workers and Prisma together. Uh, Prisma is also a great way to actually access the underlying data just in general, um, where you can sort of set your schema uh, and, and not have to worry about writing the actual uh, uh, SQL statements to actually go back to the database and, and, and make those operations. Uh, this also opens, uh, opens up really cool applications uh, together, right? So, so one is take your existing database and build out a scalable application on top of it, right? Just with the data you have. And each worker can have its own assigned Prisma schema within it. So you can have all these different schemas sort of layered on top of your, you know, typical relational database you have. What's really exciting about this is generally with data, with data proxies, they live in one specific region, right? Or your database might live in one specific region. Um, and you don't get low latency uh, across the globe. And that's where Cloudflare Cache can be really impactful, right? So in a worker, you get access to the Cloudflare Cache API, which is the ability to store arbitrary data inside of Cloudflare's cache, like the same cache we use for the CDN. Um, and that's really exciting because now you can take this sort of single region database you might have along with the data proxy and scale it up across the globe, right? And be accessing data you know, wherever your users are and storing it there. Um, you could even layer in durable objects here as well uh, if you need to go make writes back to your database to make those writes strongly consistent even when they're acting on top of uh, uh, cache data, um, which is super exciting. I think that will help a bunch with sort of the single region nature of the data proxy. Um, and really help build scalable global apps from, from day one. So what, what sort of applications could you imagine building here? I mean, one that I think we, we would talk about is the ability to put um, authentication directly at the edge. So you can use Cloudflare's cache plus the data proxy to you know, you push auth tokens out um, and handle those right at the edge. Uh, we've talked a lot internally about doing you know, token revocation and those sorts of things. It's sort of the best of both worlds for, for workers. It's kind of a more advanced use case, but at the same time, um, really has low latency uh, requirements and being close to your end user is really great for that. Um, another thing kind of more aspirational maybe would be to build out your own GraphQL layer, right? With caching built in for your client applications and have you know Prisma return results back to you. You process them and manipulate them and kind of expose a GraphQL API um, that's globally distributed to all of your underlying applications. Um, it doesn't stop here, right? You can build out full applications across the board um, and the experience is really great. Got to test out the proxy the other day and the ability to use Prisma inside of a worker uh, really abstracts away a lot of the problems um, that, that you face managing and scaling infrastructure, both on the compute side with workers and on the database side with Prisma. I'm so super excited for this. Um, yeah, and thank you very much. If it, what I've said interests you, feel free to reach out to me and talk a little bit more about your specific use case. I'm happy to chat anytime. If you're interested in workers, uh, we're always hiring. We're looking for people to, to help build out the platform, so I have to get that plug in. Um, and yeah, uh, feel free to reach out, and thanks again.